Hello, this is Neil with Rock Our World. I have a very amb ambitious project to tackle. I had a friend come to me a couple days ago and, and asked me for some information on the, on the appointed times of the Lord, particularly the seven yearly festivals, but I uh, always want to make it clear that the Lord gave us nine appointed times to keep. And uh, so what I'm going to do is try and put all of this into one episode. So that's what's ambitious about it. It took me now 11 years to learn these things. And I'm not saying I know everything. But the picture becomes clearer and clearer. And thus, I, I should be able to explain it more quickly. And I what I'll do in my commentary, I'll go and uh, point out the very best episodes that I've put together over the years to ex explain the, these things more fully. But I want to, for the first time, put the whole thing into one episode. So I'm going to be rushing here. Get it all done. This whole project started with a challenge. Uh, I, For some years I had been asking the Lord about the New Moon Festival because in studying Scripture, um, I could see that the New Moon Festival was something that was important and God has asked us to keep it. And yet, nobody that I fellowshiped with over the years and God would take us, on, he took us on this journey, and I'm going to say through the wilderness, but the, the first part, the, most of the years it was first a church, a certain amount of time, and then another one, like a group, and then another one, like we... We spent the first 23 years in the Worldwide Church of God, and they believed we should keep the yearly festivals, but they didn't have one of them, the Feast of First Fruits. And the reason they didn't have that one uh, is that the Jewish people don't have it. They ignore it. And uh, I'm not, I can only speculate why. It's all about Jesus, and they don't want Jesus in their theology, so uh, that would be one spec speculation. The other one that was missing with worldwide, and it's still and it's missing with the messianics we went to the, uh, to next, and it's missing with the Jewish people is the observance of the new moon festival. Now the Jews will the Jews will say they do it, but all they do is acknowledge the tiny sliver when it comes up in the western sky, and they say that's the new moon. Well, the new moon festival is obviously at least a day. And in 1 Samuel 20, the entire chapter, you will see that it's lasted two days. So uh, I've always taught it can be one or two days. You've got to watch the signs which come from the moon in this case. The moon tells us when the Sabbath is. It tells us when the new moon festival is. And it, and it divides out the six working days of each week. And that's a non-familiar concept. We're used to the idea that it's seven repeated, repeated continuously. But that's not God's revelation. That's Babylon's revelation. Okay, let's get moving here. So I'm packing 11 years into 30 minutes. Uh, so I had this first challenge by a friend called me in 2008 and said, I keep the Sabbath a different way. He wasn't trying to convert me. He just wanted to be up front if we ever did um, business in the future or just didn't want to be uh, me laboring under a false pretense. Anyway, I it really brought up my, my uh, curiosity. He said he kept, kept the Sabbath a different way, that he uh, watched the moon to find when the Sabbath was. And I immediately went into a, a research while well, my wife helped me. I was out on the road working, and we printed off some documents off the off the internet. I just entitled it the the uh, lunar Sabbath, and that started me on this journey of finding what on earth what on earth <laughs> is the new moon festival. And then the journey just kept moving. So uh, the next step in this project. And again, this took me many years, so it's quite a con condensation. I had got to the point where I understood that the word 4150 
in Hebrew means appointed times. And I'm just going to give you, I, I have a whole stack of paper here. Let's see how thick it is. And this was using, I'm going to try and, uh, I'll just give you an example here. You can see that uh, Genesis 1.14 and the word 4150 there, I got circled. So this is how, um, you know, when you do a real in-depth study, you would, uh, w with our modern tools, you can really, really speed this thing up. Uh, and I used, or my wife used, eSword, which is right there on my computer, my little window there. I'm not very computer savvy, so uh, my wife actually printed that all off on me. But anyone that's familiar with computers and is used to the tools they provide, the software, you take that eSword, which you can download off the internet for free. They do ask for a donation, but if you're uh, on the poorer side, just use it. That's what it's meant for. And then some way that's rich, they can throw in and cover your uh, your expense, your your part. And uh, then you have this eSword, then you can use it to print off, in this case, everywhere the word 4150 is used. And uh, what the next step is you need a good translation. And the translation that was on eSword was not a good one. I mean, they all have some value, but this is the very best one, in my opinion, to date. It was, uh, this JPS version was done in the year 2000, and they used all the best Hebrew experts at that point which wasn't so long ago. I wish they would do another one in 2019, but it's a, a very effective tool. They they wrote it in, a, in quite understandable English, and uh, this is what the first use, use of the word 4150 says. It says, God said, Genesis 1.14, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky. And of course, he's talking about the sun and the moon to separate day and night. They shall serve as signs for the set times. Now, the JPS uses set times here. I say the very best translation of 4150 is appointed times. It's an appointment with the Lord. So, uh, the we got this word 4150. What you're going to find out, and, and again, your program will, will uh, give you all this information. It's used 213 times in the Torah, Prophets, and Writings. That's what is the Hebrew document that we're talking about here. And that's what, uh, when Paul wrote the First Timothy in Tim First Timothy 3.16, and he said, all scriptures breathed by God, he was referring to that document, the Torah, the Prophets, and the Writings. And this is the very best translation from that document, which was written in Hebrew. And uh, he was not referring to his letter. That's the point I'm making. He was just writing a letter to Timothy. And uh, uh, believers have to embrace this, that the, what they call the Old Testament is the scriptures. And it's breathed by God, and it's used to establish doctrine. That didn't change. What did change is they translated the Aramaic uh, that the New Testament was written in, so-called New Testament, and they translated it into Greek and they changed a whole bunch of words and inflections and concepts and they they had an agenda and they wanted to develop what I had just called in my last episode, I called it the Greek law. And I actually, the, in my description, I actually called it the on law. <laughs> I've invented a new word, the Greek on law. They, they, their purpose was to prove that Jesus did away with the law even though the Lord didn't allow him, them, to change Matthew 5, 17 to 19. So it's important you read those uh, three verses in Matthew 5. Anyway, i got to get moving here. So there's your first use of the word 4150. Of these 213 times, you're going to find that about half of that, it's used to describe the tabernacle in the wilderness. And... The correct translation of the title of that of that uh, tent of meeting uh, is the tent 
of Mihin on the appointed times of the Lord. That would be the correct translation. It's quite a few words. That's its precise meaning. The Lord always wants us to meet him on his appointed times. And we're talking about Jesus Christ here. That's another clouded thing in, in Christian theology is that, uh, as it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 4, that was Jesus Christ that lived in that tent. That was his home while they went through the wilderness. And Jesus Christ never changes. Yesterday, today, and forever. God never changes. It's another concept that that uh, Christians overlook in, in peddling their theology that they learned at the Bible schools that was passed along for 1,700 years from Constantine, who was a pagan sun worshiper. Uh, Constantine was the one that gave the Christian church three false doctrines. Uh, Sunday is on Sabbath is one of those false doctrines. Or Sabbath is on Sunday. Uh, the festival of Easter, which is a pagan name of a of a demon, and then the celebration of Christmas. Those three doctrines are are a strong mixture of paganism with the worship of God, and God says He hates that. Don't do that. Anyway, I'm not getting very far, so I gotta put her in the next gear here. So that's the first use of the word 4150. The way to find out what a word means is to look at all its uses in scripture. So it's going to be quite an extensive study, study you go through. And once you establish it means a point of time, there you have its first use. That the sun and the moon give us signs for the appointed times. Uh, all previous translations will leave it a little hazy using that particular verse. But this JPS is, is quite clear. Uh, that the, the sun and moon give us give signs for the appointed times. And then you go to the book of Enoch, chapter 72 to 80, and Enoch gives a full description of all the signs that the sun give and all the signs that the moon give. And he makes it clear that the sun establishes the months of the year, not the moons like the Jewish people do. The, the Jewish calendar is man-made. And... Uh, as I said, they observe only seven of the appointed times. They, they say the Sabbath is Saturday, which is an error. And uh, just like Christians say the Sabbath is Sunday, that's an error. The Sabbath is when God says the Sabbath is. It's an appointed time, and he wants to meet you on his appointed times. And there's nothing wrong with meeting the Lord on other days, too. It's just that he wants you to meet him on his appointed times. You can meet him every day of the week, and you, then you got it all covered. Okay, the moon establishes, when you put all the pieces together, the moon tells us, it gives us signs when the Sabbath day is, when the new moon festival is, and when the six working days are. Whereas the sun gives us signs to tell us when the months are, so then we can establish when to keep the yearly festivals. Now let's move to Ezekiel 45, 17, and again this study I showed you, you know, you're going to you're going to get to that that of these 213 uses of this word. And it, it says, and the JPS again is, is quite clear. It's quite understandable English. Whereas all previous translations are, can be a bit fuzzy on, uh, they didn't know what the word meant. So of course they had, I think in the old King James, there was easily nine or 10 different translations of the word. Well, that is very confusing when it only means one thing and you're saying it, mean, it means nine different things, nine, nine, ten different things. So we'll boil it down to this one thing. It means a point in time. And then we go to Ezekiel forty-five seventeen, and the Lord says, these are my appointed times, the Sabbath, the new moon festival, and the yearly festivals, of which there are seven, that's a total of nine appointed times. And these are the Lord's appointed times. And, and collectively, they teach us the whole plan of the kingdom of God. And see, Christians have focused on the message of salvation. That's one aspect of this entire plan that has 
nine appointed times in it. And remember, our God is a trillion times smarter than us, so he's got this figured out. He wants us to keep his appointed times on the right days. So he gave us a calendar that's found in Enoch, and he challenges us to come and meet him. Just like they did in the tent in the wilderness, they would come meet him on his appointed times. And he still wants us to do that. The same Jesus Christ, who is the messenger of the Father. He came with a message. Read John 14, 15, 16, 17. You get a very clear picture that Jesus didn't bring anything that was of himself. It was completely 100% a message from the Father. They are 100% on the same page. The Holy Spirit is. There is no room for argument on doctrine. God says what is. And our challenge is, are we going to obey or not obey? Okay, so now we know from uh, Ezekiel 45, 17, that we have nine appointed times. The yearly ones are listed as the, uh, the Passover, which is the revelation of the salvation of Jesus Christ and his blood, shed blood. And then we move immediately into the Days of Unleavened Bread, which follows immediately the Passover. And he died just as the sun was setting on the Passover. And just before the sunset, going into the first day of Unleavened Bread. So he was in the grave for three days. So then the, the Days of Unleavened Bread are part of the, the revelation of the, of the uh, uh, salvation of Jesus Christ. He came out of the grave on the third day, just at sunset. You can read all these details in the four testimonies of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They, Mary and the others arrived at the, at the grave uh, the next morning. Of course, the day ended at sunset, so it's dark. They came in the morning and it says that Jesus was already risen. Well, he, to spend three days and three nights in the grave, he had to rise just before sunset. And that was on the weekly Sabbath, because if you go back to Deuteronomy 16 and Leviticus 23, the Feast of First Fruits is on the Sabbath when the harvest begins. And Jesus Christ was the beginning of the harvest. So this is a spiritual explanation. It always was, always will be. We go to the Sabbath, it's in the midst of the days of unleavened bread. And on this year, the Passover is April 3rd. The first day of unleavened bread is April 4th, and the Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath, is on April 5th. And that's where you start the count of 49 days, that is seven sevens, which is obviously a Jubilee cycle. So we're celebrating a Jubilee cycle, and I've been teaching that's the Jubilee cycle that the Great Tribulation unfolds in. And the purpose of the Great Tribulation is to produce the first fruits of God. We start with one, Jesus Christ, and we escalate to this 144,000, and that is going to be God's church for three and a half years. And I've pointed you to Revelation 12 for more of that revelation, but I'm not going to get this all in if I get down too many rabbit trails. So here we have the Passover and the half of the days of Olam bread. We'll put it that way. The first three days of the seven days are a revelation of the salvation of Jesus Christ, how his blood covered our sins when he rose from the dead. Then that's the moment we have, uh, we have salvation provided for us. And not only us, but all the people in the past that lived righteous lives, and they also had their salvation provided for them. Even though they had done a good job, they had to wait until Jesus died and rose from the dead three days later. So that's the picture and uh, because the days of unleavened bread picture getting rid of sin, that's uh, Jesus did half the task. I'm going to put it this way. I'm trying to uh, show how the festivals uh, explain the whole plan of God's kingdom, not salvation. See, salvation is part of the message. Jesus, when he's here, he said, I've come to bring the kingdom to you. This is the good news and the hope of the kingdom. That's what Jesus always preached. 
Whereas Christians have always preached a message of salvation, it's an incomplete message. It's only part of the picture. So we have these days of unleavened bread, which picture getting rid of sin. Jesus did half the job, okay? He got rid of all our past sins, blotted them out with his blood. He got rid of all our future mistakes, because humans make mistakes. But bear this in mind very clearly. He, he does not uh, accept us blatantly sinning past the point when we repent of our sins and come out of the grave of baptism. Okay, that's the, the starting point. When we accept Jesus into our lives, say, Jesus, come into my life. I, I don't want to do this anymore on my own. I need you to help me. That's the moment the blood covers your past sins and your future mistakes. But uh, many Christians don't fully grasp this, that it has to walk hand in hand with repentance. You have to understand what sin is. Sin is the transgression of the Torah, 1 John 3, 4. And you have to walk out your life in a, in a way that you're getting rid of sin. And uh, this gets all confused with, oh, well, you're working out your own salvation. No, your salvation is already there. But you're going to lose that. And this, this is <laughs> lots of arguments on that. If you just keep on sinning, you aren't saved at all. But if you start down that road and then you quit, uh, you're in grave danger because your name can be taken out of the book of life. And that's, that's what this is all about. Your journey is to keep working on sin. It's not to quit anytime. And no, you're not earning your salvation by working on sin. This whole thing is very clear if you read scripture. It's when you don't read scripture and you go to church and they, the, the preachers don't understand these things either. So they're teaching false doctrines. They're confusing you constantly. What we need is the teachers, the pastors, the teachers to understand these concepts they're easy to explain. What's hard is getting rid of the paradigms that have been uh, put in place for uh, 1,700 years. And in fact, Paul saw the spirit of lawlessness working while he was still alive. Now, I better speed along. So we got the Passover and we got the, uh, the first three days of the Days of Unleavened Bread dealing with sin. Okay, that's salvation. And then the the other four days, could we could say they picture our continuing task to be vigilant about sin. And it's not like if we, we commit a sin accidentally or through weakness, we lost our salvation. That's not what it's about. It's about uh, putting diligent effort into removing sin from your life. That's what the Days of Unleavened Bread picture. You're... You're taking leaven out of your life. That's what it's all about. That's the, the picture of our journey of salvation. Now, uh, we change gears because there's more to the kingdom. So we go, we start counting these 49 days, which is seven weeks, which is obviously a, a jubilee cycle, and we count up to the Feast of Weeks. And Jubilee 6 says clearly that this this is one festival in a, in a very strong sense. I mean, we're counting it as two, and God does too, but he says in Jubilee 6, this is really one festival with a 49-day count in between, and it means something. It means the tribulation is going to be 50 years long, or a Jubilee cycle, and it means that God is creating his first fruits in this space of time. So the great tribulation is about to begin. That's a warning going out loud and clear. And he wants you to be one of the first fruits. So uh, we want to be diligent with our lives. We want to be doing all the things that it takes, uh, all the investments to build our house out of pure gold, pure silver, and precious jewels. So now we get to the Feast of Weeks, and that would picture the completion of the creation of the first fruits and that actually pictures the return of Christ that you find in Zechariah 14 when he touches down in the Mount of Olives and we see it in Revelation 19. That's the end product of the Jubilee cycle of the Great Tribulation.
Jesus returns in great power and great uh, authority, and he judges the nations. It's the first thing he does. He subdues the armies that are surrounding Jerusalem. They just uh, die. You know, like it says in Zechariah, their eye sockets dissolve out of their eyes and their their flesh just dissolves off their body. They die supernaturally. They're evil. You know, they had had all those years to turn their hearts to the Lord and they did not. So, where are we at here? Uh, not, not as far as I want it to be. So the, we get to the fall feast at this point. The, the Feast of Trumpets pictures the return of Christ in Revelation 19 and Zechariah 14. He uh, judges the nations. That's the, the revelation of the Day of Atonement. It's a time of judgment. That's why we fast for 20, almost 24 hours. It's from sunset to sunset. That's how God, God's days work. So we, we fast. Uh, on that day, no water and no food. Okay, that's the only fast we'll ever do without water. All other fasts, it's highly recommended you drink water, but in the end, it's your choice. But you don't live very long if you don't drink water. That's an important concept. You, you would start fading within a, a number of days. And but whereas without eating food, you can go. You can go 40 days. I, I've done it a couple times, so I know firsthand that it can be done. Our bodies uh, have a lot, a lot stored a lot of uh, energy in our, not only our fat, but our flesh. Anyway, uh, so we've got through the Day of Atonement, and then the very last festival of the year, of the seven, is the Feast of Tabernacles, which we could see as a, as a celebration of all the harvest of the of all time up to this point there's going to be a, a future harvest at the end of a thousand years that's even greater it, this is my theology and i've talked about this before so uh, i won't go down that rabbit trail i will give you a list of of uh, episodes where you can go further on this and get a better explanation a more complete explanation i should say now what i want to do i've covered the seven feasts and what they mean and their fulfillment and uh, just throw in this too, that in the Feast of Tabernacles, one of the things we do is we build a temporary uh, dwelling. And it's to remind us of the, of the 40 years that the Israelites went through the wilderness. But uh, bear this in mind that that whole exercise of going through the wilderness on a jubilee cycle from the time they left, from the time the plague started till the time they crossed the Jordan was a full jubilee cycle. And that was a prophecy of the one ahead of us. We are going to go on another journey, and we will live in temporary dwellings. We will be uh, have to leave our homes, most of us. We'll have to uh, wander about, and we'll have to trust completely on uh, in the Lord to look after us. And He will. It'll be very, very supernatural. He's established. He is establishing places of safety, safe havens, safe countries. Canada is supposed to be a safe country. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Denmark is. I learned this at the Hel Holocaust Museum in Israel. Denmark was the only country in the whole world that that saved its entire population of Jewish people. The night before the Gestapo showed up to arrest everybody, uh, they f found out about it, and they uh, the citizens rallied and took all their Jewish uh, friends and citizens across. The, cha uh, the channel to, I think it's Sweden, and, you know, across a piece of water right there, and they, they all escape. Isn't that cool? So anyway, Dan isn't, isn't listed in the listing of the, the tribes that make up 144,000. I'm just wondering if Dan has an even more special role uh, that is yet to be seen. Anyway, I'm digressing on a rabbit trail. I want to quickly, so I've covered the seven festivals and just a brief look at what they mean in, in the whole, whole plan of God's kingdom. And bear in mind what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14, and Revelation 14, 6. He said that this good news and hope of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world to every tongue, tribe, every group of people, everyone will have a chance to hear the good news of the kingdom in the midst of the Great Tribulation. 
That's when it happens. That's the most important part of the Great Tribulation, is that everyone gets to hear the message about the Kingdom of God, not the message of salvation. The message of salvation is, as I said, one part. It's the Passover and the first three days of unleavened bread until Jesus rose from the dead. That is the explanation of salvation right there. All the other feasts expand to the whole plan. No, I want to back up to the Sabbath day and the New Moon Festival. The Sabbath day pictures the thousand years of the kingdom. This is the next step after the Great Tribulation. We're going to have a thousand years. Satan will be locked in a prison. And he'll be released for a short period, likely a jubilee cycle, right at the end of the thousand years. It will complete a thousand years of complete peace and no Satan. That is the picture of the Sabbath day. That's the seven thousandth thousandth uh, year. The six days represent the time Satan has as the god of this world, and we get to labor under this darkness but we're challenged with are we going to do it god's way or satan's way and 99.9 .9 percent of the people even that call themselves believers are doing it satan's way they they say they believe in god they go to church they listen to what's taught but they do not read these books and I'm, uh, I know I'm overstating this, but just reading the scriptures the pastor gives to you is not reading this, the scriptures. You have to start in Genesis, read all the way to Revelation. You have to do it enough times it's downloaded into your spirit. I exaggerate a little bit in my last uh, episode there. I don't want people to feel bad. There's some real quick minds and God's going to speed everything up. We're going to learn very quickly. So. If you only have time to read it a couple times, do it. But get it into your spirit so the Holy Spirit can explain it to you. And there's people like myself and many others that understand, at least to some degree, that can explain these things. So back to our revelation of the Sabbath day is all about this thousand years at the end of Satan's six working days. That's when uh, men work, guided by the God of this world, Satan, and uh, it comes to nothing. And then we have the Great Tribulation, a 50-year period sandwiched in between this uh, six working days. And then we have the thousand years, the rest that remains for the people of God. That's uh, one of the scriptures. And uh, I'll put it in my description. Uh, that's the thousand years. That's the Sabbath day. Now, the New Moon Festival is the eighth day. That's an idiom. That's why we go through four seven-day cycles the moon points these out and then the moon goes dark for one or two days after that 28 day four times seven we have four sabbaths four sets of working day six working days and then we stop we have a pause and we have the eighth day that's the new moon festival it points towards the new heavens and the new earth and we celebrate that once every moon cycle uh, we watch the moon to tell us when the Sabbath is, when the six working days are, and when the new moon festival is. And once every moon cycle, we celebrate the looking forward to the time when there is no more time. And that's why it's, it's kind of like you look at it as the eighth day is time outside of time. There is no more time once the new heavens and the new earth come down. And you read about it right at the end of Re Revelation, and there's a companion scripture in Isaiah, I'll put those in my description too, that talk about the new heavens and the new earth, and that's the time when there will be no more flesh. There will be no more fleshly humans. Everything's finished. Uh, and we have the the, the kingdom of God, the, the city of God, the uh, Zion. That's what Zion is. It's the throne room of God. It's the city of God, and it comes down to earth and then uh, that is an eternal situation. So that goes on forever and ever and ever. The eighth day is the time when there is no more time. So that's what we celebrate when we keep the New Moon Festival, and that's been reserved right to this end. And uh, that's what God was doing with me when he stirred me to question what is this New Moon Festival starting in, and then starting in 2008, 
I started on the study and he guided me along with it and then uh, if you go to my uh, um, testimony of uh, finding the new moon festival back in I think it's 9 10 11 somewhere in there I'll put it in my description uh, took a few years to get through all that and then I went to a, a feast in Gary South Dakota with equipped with uh, Ezekiel 45 17 and Genesis 1 14 those are the two scriptures when you put the whole picture together God wants us to keep his nine appointed times and they explain the entirety of his plan and uh, the Christians focus on the on the message of salvation is just one part of what God wants us to be teaching okay it's a wrap Neil with Rock Our World.